Okay, so the next topic um, that we should look at is the topic of classes. And um, classes in programming um, is something that is extremely, extremely, extremely useful. Um, it is essentially almost impossible to write any meaningful um, computer program, even if it's a, a relatively small and simple program, without using classes. So the basis of classes is basically um, that it allows or it makes it easy to do object-oriented programming or OOP. So typically a program, um, it can be short, it can be 10 lines, it can be, can be two lines and do something useful, but typically programs that you use in bioinformatics when you're doing analyses of um, biological data sets may run into thousands of lines of code. Okay? That's, not, that's not unusual. If you wrote a linear program, in other words, you start at the one end and you have variables that are being assigned and you have for loops and while loops and you have if statements and so on and you have the, the sort of odd functions that you're calling. But the program starts at the top and, and basically works its way to the bottom and the bottom basically it's writing out um, the results of the analysis as a file to disk or so. Um, that is actually quite an inefficient way of programming and it's also very, very difficult to maintain. Um, because if you want to change something, you need to actually work your way th through the entire program and make sure that you're not tinkering and changing something at some point that um, impacts at another point. And um, this was especially true and especially difficult um, in the 1980s um, when um, the, the programming language BASIC was actually um, widely used. And for instance, in the BASIC programming language, there was a statement go to and that was followed by a line number. So um, you may have something like, you know, if a certain condition is, is true, um, um, then go to line number 2010 or whatever. And at line 2010, you may have some statement. And at that point, there may be a go to a line um, um, 230. And um, so you, you, you had the possibility of having thousands of lines of code with jumps sort of occurring from one position to another position and it became really extremely difficult to to maintain this code so if you didn't write the code and someone gave it to you and asked you to sort of make a small change you had to work your way through all the code and really understand it and really see where all the loops were and the conditions were okay so modern programs are written in a totally different way and they object oriented okay and that makes it very tidy and very much easier to write, and it makes it much easier to maintain. So object orientation, or OOP itself, is, is a, is a um, field in computer science. And um, there are various philosophies about it, and some of the discussion um, about the, the properties of object orientation um, can be quite esoteric. Um, but I think for our purposes, it's fine to say that an object-oriented approach you have data members and you have functions and if the data members, so these are just variables and the functions are related, um, it's often useful to combine them in a group. So somehow you throw variables and functions that have to do with the same type of thing, you throw into a single group. And this single group, in fact, is a class. So you can define a class that provides this group of data members and functions. And you can assign that class, so A equals um, class, um, th let's call the class class, and you can actually assign this class to the variable, and when you assign the class to the variable, the class is instantiated. That means um, the class has now sort of become um, live in a manner of speaking, okay? Um, and if it has become instantiated, uh, it's live, it's prepared for use, the data members may be initialized, for instance. Um, the class that's associated with a signed variable um, is called an object. So this may sound a little bit um, confusing initially, but you essentially have a class that you've defined, and in this class, 
you have lots, lots of data members and functions. Remember, we were working previously with things like strings and lists and so on. And these things were but essentially just classes and they had sort of member functions and they had data members as well. And remember the member functions, we could call things like len and we could call uppercase, etc., etc. right? Um, so once you assign this class to a variable, the instantiated or live class is simply called an object. Okay? So because you can actually call and assign the class numerous times, so B can also be class. Okay? And C can also be class. So you basically have multiple instantiations of class and the variable basically does refer to the class but once the class has become instantiated and its data, mem data members and um, um, has been initialized then it's simply referred to as an object. Okay? So each of these three variables will basically um, refer to different objects but the different objects will all be of the same class. Okay. So let's have a look at how to, um, to actually define a class and how class is instantiated. So class in Python is defined quite simply. So once again, like, like a, um, a, a method, you basically define the classes at the top of your, um, of your, of your Python text file. Okay? So when you start using the class in your code body, the class must have been defined like a function. Otherwise, the interpreter won't know what members are in the class. So you define classes towards the top of your, of your Python text, and you simply use the keyword class. And then that is followed by the name of the class. So I'm simply calling this my class, and a colon. And so we've seen this before. Um, everything below that's indented. Um, up to the end of the class, okay? So you may sort of, just to be tidy, leave a bit of space um, before you go to the body of the code, or you can choose to define um, additional classes over here, okay? So class keyword space, the name of the class, colon, and then this is followed by um, description of the class itself. So in this class, which is called my class, I have two methods. So the method definition is, is performed exactly the way that we've seen it um, um, before. So you have the keyword def, you have the, the name of the function. Now, in round brackets, is something that we pass that we call self. Okay? I'll get back to the self in a second. Then in method one, so basically there's the colon, there's the indented text, so this is the, the, the code that goes with method one and um, there's just a bit of space for, for tidiness and over here def and method 2 and again this strange um, word self there's the colon indented text print this is method 2 this one printed out this is method 1 and um, the text is de-indented um, and over here basically um, is the, the the code body so in the in the main part of the of the program um, and this is the full class def definition so the class my class simply contains two members method one and method two okay so how do we instantiate the class how do we how how can we do something with it to actually use the members so we simply take any variable and I'm using the variable my class it can also be a or x it doesn't matter and we basically assign the class, my class, to that variable. Now note, and this is important, my class is assigned and there's an open and close round bracket. Okay? So the interpreter knows that what is happening here is that I'm actually in, um, basically instantiating the class. Okay? Um, because even though, um, okay, let's let, so essentially instantiating the class, and now my class basically is an object of the type my class. Okay, and you can now actually use the um, the object, which is my class, which is the variable. Basically, it just refers to the object. And then there's a point there, and then method one, and you're simply calling method one with um, open and close brackets, and this will print out this is method one.
And this line of text that says my class, so it's basically this variable that points to the object of my class and we're calling, so that's the point, so that's a reference, so this is something that's in that, okay? So method 2 is a member, method 2 is a member of my class, and now basically we're calling that, and method 2, open, close, round brackets, method 2, this is method 2, so it prints out, this is method 2. Okay, so let's quickly go back to um, the um, brackets and the fact that we're passing things, we're not passing things, but we're sort of specifying things here. Basically, self is a reference to the instantiated object. So, when you instantiate the class here, and you assign the object to my class, then there's a, in that object that's assigned, there is a reference self that is basically um, you can almost think, think of it as, as some type of ID number, okay? And what happens is this reference self is uniquely tied to the object that's assigned to this class. So whenever you want to do something with this class, the interpreter wants to know what is this self number. And Typically, you can see here, for instance, I'm calling the method one with self, okay? So with some type of ID number. But actually, when I call, make the call here, so here's the object, and I'm referencing method one, I'm not passing anything because the interpreter actually puts in self sort of internally when it's calling method one. And my class has so object, um, referencing method 2, round brackets, although the definition here of the, the class function contains the word self, you actually don't pass anything there, it is passed internally by, um, by the interpreter. If you wanted to do anything to variables in this particular function, you'll have to use self, and you'll see um, in the next slide how that works. Okay, so um, when a class is instantiated, there's a call to a function um, double underscore in it, double underscore, and then round brackets, open close, and self. And this call um, in it, self, is equivalent to, for those of you who have experience in C++, to a C++ constructor. So it's basically when the class gets instantiated and the object is made and the reference to the object is passed to the variable to which that particular class is assigned, then at that point this constructor, this init statement is called and it gives you the opportunity to initialize any object parameters um, or variables or attributes of that object that you want um, before it's fully alive, okay? Um, and apart from the um, constructor, there's also a destructor, which is double underscore del, double underscore, and also self that's passed here. And basically, this um, function, class function, is called just before the object goes out of scope, which means just before the object gets finally destroyed and deleted. It calls delete, or del, I beg your pardon, and this function, and this gives you the opportunity to do any type of cleanup you wanted to do before an object goes out of scope, okay? So, let's just look at um, these two functions. So here's class, my class, colon, indented text, um, then define the function init, and now you can see I'm passing, so over there is the value self, comma, value close round brackets, colon. Here's the definition, or the, the body of the text of that definition. And what I'm, what I'm, what I'm basically doing um, in this functional definition is I'm saying self dot my value equals value. Okay, so what, what, what's actually what's happening here? So this self, uh, this self is still the, pre, the, the same as the self that, we previously, that we've previously seen. So essentially, the 
Um, when the class gets instantiated, the an, an, an ad- type of number, identity number, you can almost think of it, gets associated um, with a parameter um, self. Okay, and that self must be passed to any function of the class. So, for instance, if you have a equals um, my class, okay, and b equals my class, and in my class there's some type of variable, and a, say the variable is x, you want to set to a certain value, you want to be sure that you're only setting that class variable um, to a value in the object um, uh, pointed to by A, or referenced by A, not by B. So even though A and B are objects of the same class, they're in fact different instantiations and different objects. So they're identical classes, but they're different objects, and you can basically manipulate the two objects totally independently. And because of that, it is important that when you write the code in the definitions, you include the self in basically all of the function calls in the class because that self gets passed as part of the object to which this A refers. And that self is different from the self that is pointed to um, by B. Okay, So self basically makes sure that when you make a call to either a function or to a variable in an object that it's a specific object that, or that it's the object that you intend it to be. So you don't change the other objects in the same class. So all the functions um, will um, have the, um, the, the call to self. Um, over here, I'm also now passing a, um, a different parameter that I simply call value. And so I'm saying self, um, my value, so this is a assignment of a variable my value and this variable my value belongs to the object so all the objects in the class so a and b will have a variable my value but you'll be able to discriminate between my value in a and my value in b because the interpreter will basically on its own pass the self um, when that's um, when it's called okay so self reference my value is simply the value that's passed in this init. So what you will do for instance is my object equals my class and now it's not simply round brackets so um, well it is round brackets but it's not empty basically you're passing um, the value 5 and what will happen this value that's passed um, to um, the the class when you basically instantiate it, this in fact is that value that gets passed in the init. So whatever value so you can pass values to classes when you basically instantiate them. Um, just make sure that your init um, definition, um, functional definition, has the various um, um, variables over here or the various variable names that can receive the number of um, of parameters that you basically pass. So over here I'm just set my value to value. Okay? And over here when I um, when the class goes out of, of scope it simply prints the um, the string bye bye. Okay. So let's have a little bit, little further look at self. So self is a reference to the instantiated object of the class. So it's a type of ID number so the class basically is instantiated and then this object comes in existence and this unique object has a specific ID number um, that is assigned to self. So self provides a reference for class functions to refer to the same class variable. So if you have a, if you have a, a class then there's a class variable like in the previous one, uh, my value, um, you can use self so that it refers to the um, to the same variable, um, but each object that variable is actually different. Okay, so um, so you can almost think of self as the namespace of the object. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's uh, not entirely um, correct, but that's a, a way in which 
uh, it'll probably make um, um, quite a bit of sense. Okay, so over here, class definition, my class, um, define the function in net. So this is always there, and there's value, and now um, basically as, uh, assigning um, a, um, a class variable, um, self.function value, so every object will have its own functional value, and I'm assigning the value that's passed here, okay, to function value. Um, over here, definition del self, print by. Um, okay, and over here I'm basically um, defining um, another function, um, print value, and as is usual for all class functions, it will contain um, a key itself, and then th this particular class function um, contains a single command print self function value. So basically, this function, even though it's assigned um, as um, inside the init definition, and I've previously told you that when you have a function definition and you have a variable that's assigned, then this variable that's assigned by the function is a local variable. So how is it possible now that over here I'm assigning a, um, a variable, um, self.function, but then in this function I'm actually printing um, self.function. How, how does this function, which is different from this function, know about the existence of um, self.function value? And the, the secret to that lies in the fact that this is basically um, a, a class variable. So basically um, it is known, it will be known to all the various functions in that class because it is referenced via the self keyword, which is the idea, which I beg your pardon, which is the, the ID of the object um, that is instantiated um, by the class. So over here, uh, my object, my class, basically calling it with a value of 5, and um, print value, which now calls this function, okay? And what it does, in fact, it prints out the value 5. So um, when the class was instantiated, this value was basically assigned to function value, and when we call with the, um, with the object, um, which is instantiation of my class, when we actually call this function, okay, print value, um, it will faithfully print out the variable self dot function value, which is five, and it then exits because that's the end of the code, and the um, the del uh, underscore underscore del um, underscore underscore executes and it prints by. Okay, so self is a type of reference to a object once it's been instantiated and assigned to a object name or to a variable. Okay, so let's look at class and object variables. Um, so the important point to realize is that class and object variables um, can actually be independently manipulated. So you can basically um, access and change them independently. So let's start off with a class, my class, that we're basically defining. And we're not, not defining any initialization um, routines or any variables that should be initialized um, um, during the initialization of the class or anything that should be done uh, when the class goes out of scope. We simply define a variable that we call my variable and we set that equal to zero. Okay, so um, that's the full class definition. Um, so here the code is de-indented, so again, that's the, um, the end of the, um, the class definition. So over here, the first um, a line of text, we're basically instantiating an object that we call my object, and this object is an object of my class. So basically, my class has been instantiated, it's an object, and that object is equal to the variable my object. Right, so let's go ahead and print and we, as reference, use my class point my variable. 
And when we try that, what is printed out is actually the value zero. So that's the, values, that's the value that was assigned to my variable. Let's do the following now. Let's actually take the object, so my object, point my variable. So now it points to the variable that is in the object, that's part of the object, okay? Not the class, it's instantiation of the class. It's basically one, um, a copy of the class that is running. And we basically assign my variable now the value one. And the next time around we say print my class, my variable, and we see that lo and behold, it's still printing out zero. Because by changing my variable, in the object, we're not changing it in the class, okay? So the class is basically the template that's being used from which the object is derived, but the, the object basically is an instantiation of the class. So it's basically a, a independent copy of the class that is assigned to my object. So if we change the value of my, my variable in the object, then we're not changing it in the class, okay? So the class and the object variables are two different things that are independently addressable. If we print my object dot my variable, now we're actually printing out one, which is the value to which we assigned it, okay? Um, just a reminder that you assign variables in the initialization function, so it's double underscore in it, double underscore, and then um, open and close brackets. And this typically in the um, class definition will have um, the, um, the variable self, which is basically a pointer to the instantiated object. And you can pass as many other variables um, in the init function that you want to use for initialization um, of, of your object. Okay. Um, right, so let's look at, at class inheritance. So class inheritance is something that um, is particularly important because you can basically have a base class and then you can inherit from that base class and add some other goodies to it that um, is important um, for you that you want to do that you specifically want to apply that base class to that may be a little bit different from um, just the bare base class itself. So we're starting off, for instance, by um, defining class base class, and we um, we have we've defined in it, and we're essentially initialize, initializing my data to the value one. So remember that self dot my data and self will be passed by the interpreter in initialization. This basically points to an object copy of my data. So this is the same as previously when we basically changed the object copy of my variable to one. So this by default, my data is basically something that's associated with the object. Okay. It's not a class variable. Uh, we can now basically ask a show data and uh, we return self my data. And in the base class, we can also um, define another function show bigger data also basically um, uh, passing self as the um, as the function parameter and in this case the function returns two times it multiplies by two self dot my data okay then we derive a class from the base class so when you derive a class you simply write class like as you would for class definition and then you give the name to the class as you would for a class definition, but then in brackets, you basically give, in round brackets, you give the name of the base class, which is the class from which you're deriving this current class, okay? Um, so base class is the parental class, and derived class is the, cl is the child class, the class that we're deriving from the parental class. And there's the colon, as we've seen with a normal class definition. Okay, now the important thing is all functions that are defined in the base class, if you redefine them in the derived class, these functions will override the parental class functions. 
So if a function is, is basically redefined, then the function as it was basically defined in the parental class essentially no longer exists. Okay? So the init function that was arrived in the parental class basically disappears and in the derived, in the derived class this is the init function that um, basically um, is relevant. Okay, so in the derived class we also basically define a show data return self my data. So this has the same name as that function show data um, self. So this function here will basically hide or override the function in the parental class. And then we have a, a function here defined show even bigger data. Um, and basically this particular function returns um, self data times three. Okay. So let's run, let's make the objects um, um, from the different classes and then call the different functions and see what happens. So let's make uh, my base class object. So obviously the class that we're calling is base class, open close brackets. Let's get a derived object. So what we call here is derived class, open close brackets. Then print my base object show data. So the base object comes from the base class and the show data will basically show the self.myData which is assigned to one here and you can see if you call show data in the base object indeed it basically prints out um, the value one. Now if you, if you basically call my derived object which is the class derived from base class um, and the function show data in that particular um, class, um, you can see in the derived class the value 2 was assigned to self.myData and indeed it prints out the value 2. If you basically call my base object show bigger data, so, base, so basically it's instantiation of base class and we're basically calling this function show bigger data which is um, the self data multiplied by two, then it prints out the value two, which is based, which is essentially two times one. Okay. Um, if you now call my derived object object show bigger data. So remember my derived object is this chap over here, but we didn't add any function to this class show bigger data. Okay. So there's nothing here that overrides this function here, okay? The, the show bigger data function. So since there's nothing that's defined in the derived class that, that overrides show bigger data, this function still exists in the derived class. So we can call it, okay? Nothing overrides it. So it's basically a member of the derived class. And we actually call show bigger data it prints out the value of 4, which is correct, which is 2 times the value of my data in the derived class is 2. 2 times 2, two, times two is 4. If we now call my derived object show even bigger data, it prints out value 6, okay, which is essentially 3 times the value of self data, which is 2. So you can see that if you derive a class, the functions or the methods in the parental class or the base class that are not overridden still exist in the derived class. But you can also add new functions to the derived class that do not exist in the parental class. So that is the, that is the value of class inheritance. That you can basically have a parental class and over here is the parent and you can derive some type of child class from that and this child class can have functions that are not present in the parent but are relevant. So for instance you may have a class of all cars and then you have a class of all electric cars. Okay, And the class of electric cars may have functions here like the um, wattage of the batteries and the, uh, the um, um, number the number of kilometers that the car can run 
on one battery charge and um, whether it actually has um, um, self-navigation software or self-driving software, that type of, top, top of thing. So essentially, um, class derivation allows you to, to reuse classes that you already defined, but um, where you add additional data members or methods to the child class that is of use in the current application of that particular class. Okay. Okay, so let's look at, um, at containers and iteration next. Um, we've previously basically met the, um, the concept of iteration when we looked at for loops and list comprehensions and generator functions. Um, remember, we wrote for um, some variable i, for i in range 0, 10. And remember, we discussed it, and basically what this um, passed back was basically a, an object of sequence type um, that basically would um, pass the number 0 to 9. So that was excluded. And we basically iterated over this object. So this was an iterable object, the sequence object type. So we can, in our own classes, we can basically um, make iterable objects. So iteration basically is simply the re repeated request to an object for consecutive data members. So iteration over this basically just every time the for loop asks for data members, so initially it returns zero, then one, then two, all the way through to nine. And then if the for loop asks for the next data member after it's returned nine, then this um, iterable object will basically just say, sorry, I'm exhausted. There are no more data members left. Okay. So any class can also be iterated over if it implements two specific methods. Uh, the two methods are basically double underscore iter, double underscore, and double underscore next, double underscore. Um, a class that allows iteration over its data members are known as container classes. So they can contain data members and you can request iteration by the class over its data members. Um, these double underscore functions um, are basically predefined. That means that um, they already exist and associated with a class. They sort of add it in the background by Python when you um, initially define your class. And if you want to have your class um, um, iterable, you have to override the default iter and next methods. Okay. Um, so when the when Python starts iterating over an object, whether it tests to see if an, if an object can be iterated over, it starts off by first calling the iter function. Um, what must happen is the, the, the implementation of iter in your class must return the reference self. So that's not, that's not too much of a problem because the class it's, it, itself knows um, the value of self because it's, it's basically passed in the initialization of the class to the class and, and exists within the object. And then Python will then use the self reference that, is re that was returned by the iteration function to call the next member in that particular object. Okay? So that self points uniquely to the object and um, it can be used to basically to uniquely call the next um, method in that particular object. And we'll do so repeatedly. Okay? And next um, should every time, I pick upon when it's called, should um, return consecutive members of a sequence. Um, so every so first time next is called the method should basically return the first um, a member of a sequence. The second time it's called it should return the second member of the sequence, and so on, and it should, con it should con continue um, returning consecutive members of the sequence until the sequence is depleted. And the next call to the function next when the sequence has been depleted must be to raise an exception and specifically a stop iterator exception that can be um, basically caught and that can be reacted to. Okay.
So to implement iteration, let's look at an example. So we simply have a class, my class, and we pass a list to the object with initialization. So here's the def init um, function, and there's the self that is passed by, um, by Python, and we're passing a um, list data. And basically in the, um, um, in the init function, we basically assign list data to a um, data member of the object itself, list data, and then we're also setting an index um, to the length of that data list. So if it contains 10 members, then we set self-index equals length of that list would be 10, for instance. Okay. So when Python calls for iteration, set the counter to zero. So over here, that's the function, that's the first function that Python will call when it wants to iterate over a class. So what we do is in the in the iter function, um, we set the counter associated with the object to zero and we return self. So remember that Python will call iter um, and if the object is iterable, it must actually return self. It will then continue to call um, the object with the, um, with the address um, assigned to self and specifically it will um, call the function double underscore next double underscore with self. Okay, so if so in this function, if the counter um, or the current state of the counter is smaller than the current state of the index. So remember, the index was set to the number of data members and the counter is set to zero. So if the counter is smaller than the index, then increment the counter. Okay. So count self dot counter plus equals one. So counter equals counter plus one. Else, if the counter is equal to the index, that means that we've run out of data members, right? Because we start the index at zero. So if the counter is 10, that means that we've already passed back zero to nine. In other, in other words, 10 members. Um, so what, what must happen then is that we must raise a stop iteration, okay? So if it's smaller than the index, then we just simply increment the counter. And if it's equal to the index, we raise a stop iteration. So we raise an exception. And at this point, if you raise an exception, it will directly raise the exception. So you have to catch it. Okay. Um, but if you don't raise the exception, it will basically come to this point and um, it will return the um, the the member the list data at the self counter minus one okay so um, essentially um, since we're incrementing here um, we have just have to dec decrement the counter by one to pass the the next value so for instance the first time it calls self the counter is zero um, the index is 10 so basically is the counter smaller that the index, so this is the first time we're calling it, so the counter is zero, index is 10. Yes, it is smaller, so let's increment the counter by one, okay? We jump over this because this is true, and then we return the list data of the counter, the first data member should be zero, okay? So since the counter is incremented here, we just decrement it by one again, so we're starting off with a zero, okay? Um, Okay, so basically, if we set my list to values to 0 to 9, my object to my class and pass my list to my class, so obviously um, in, the, um, in the init, there's the list data that's passed as the, um, um, as the data to, um, to set the um, self list data to. And the self is basically um, a hidden parameter that's basically passed by Python um, to my class. And now we're iterating for i in my object. There's my object. And print i. And indeed, it iterates over the data members that are present in the list data in my object. And the individual data members are, are basically passed or returned by the next function until the point where counter 10 equals index, at which point it will raise the exception and basically it will stop the iteration and um, essentially jump to the, um, to the next line after 
the for loop after the iteration has been stopped. Okay, so that's the way in which you can actually implement iteration in your own classes if you need to, um, to have a special type of container that you want to iterate over and recover successive data members um, from your class. Okay, so the assignment in week four um, is, is a little bit um, more challenging than the um, standard multiple choice um, exercises that you did for week one, two and three. So in week four what you have to do, and you have about a week to basically complete this and hand in your assignment, is to write a program to read the names and the sequences from a fast A file and to calculate the AT percentage of each sequence. So essentially you have to write a program that will open up the file and then read from the file line by line. So you're going to open the file. Okay. Um, there's going to be some type of path to the file and you're going to read it probably in text mode. Um, then you're going to read it line for line. So it's probably going to be some iteration um, for line in um, so this is basically the the um, the file or whatever. So for line in file, um, what you do is you read it line for line, and then you're going to test um, perhaps with some type of if statement, if um, the first character in line. So how would one define or look at the first character in line? Um, you'll do it by some type of of indexing perhaps. So the first character would be what, what index and you'll be testing is that character um, is that character equal to, um, to the character that is found on the title line of, um, of every fast A file. So is that equal to what is that character that, we, that um, the title line of a fast A file always starts off. So if that's equal then obviously the line that you, that you have is a um, is a title line so if it's a title line you want to perhaps write the title to some type of list okay if it's not a title line then it's a sequence line so else it's a sequence line and you want to add that sequence um, perhaps to some string that you have so you may have for every um, individual um, title that you encounter you open up a sequence string and then you continue um, adding sequences to the sequence string until the next time you encounter a title line and then you start a new sequence string. Okay, So think about what type of code you may want to use here. And then at the end of this all, um, once you have um, say a list of names, okay and you have a list of sequences what you may want to do is you may want to count the number of A's and the number of T's um, in sequence let's say you have five sequence five names and five sequences so you start off with sequence one and you count the number of A's and T's um, and that is all the A's plus T's divided by the total sequence length and that if you take the percentage that's the a plus t percentage and then do the same for sequence two same for sequence three etc all the way through to sequence five so that is typically type of type of approach that you would take um, the the fast a file that you'll actually need to use um, for this assignment is demo fast a file 2018 fsa so this is um, available from the directories for this um, particular course on SunLearn. Um, and this is the file that your program must read. Once you've, you've completed your, your program and you've tested that your program works correctly, then you need to upload your, your program as a single file named whatever your student number is, so xxxxx, which is your student number, dot py for Python on SunLearn. So make, please make sure that your program runs successfully before uploading it, um, because I will be marking the program by simply taking it and running it and seeing if it runs correctly.
And if it doesn't run correctly, then obviously there's a problem, then the assignment um, is not complete. Okay. So um, if you have specific queries about this assignment, please go to um, the forum as well on the SunLearn site for this course and post your, your queries on the form and I'll be visiting the form regularly and um, I'll be helping along and give you as much guidance as possible um, to allow you to basically solve um, this programmatic problem.